Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Rachel Billups. I'm your host for this new webinar, How I Am Reveals Who You Are from Amplify Media. Today, I am really excited to speak with Matt Rawl and Sarah Douay. Matt currently serves as lead pastor of Asbury United Methodist Church in Bossier City, Louisiana. Matt has authored nine studies from Abington Press, as well as his latest study, Jesus Revealed, the I Am Statements in the Gospel of John. And we are so happy to have artist and writer Sarah Douay join us today as well. Sarah is from Shreveport, Louisiana, and often combines visual and literary elements in her work. Her first book of poetry, What's Happened is Happening, Poems, is available right now. Welcome, Sarah and Matt. I'm so excited to be with you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Glad to be here, thank you. Oh, it's gonna be great. Now this book um, has been a long time in the making. You all have been partnered together for a long time. And uh, Matt, you've preached in this series before and invited Sarah to partner with you several years ago, creating art responses to them. So tell us about that first exploration into the I am statements. Yeah, it was, um, gosh, it was, it was more than 10 years ago. Actually, this started as my, um, mandatory ordination Bible study. Like for the ordination <laughs> process. Oh my goodness. Well. I forgot That's how that. it started. So yeah, for, so friends listening, like don't throw anything away. <laughs> like it, all, all good ideas have their time. Right. So, uh, yeah, it started as a four week mandatory ordination, uh, uh Bible study. Uh, but then I, I offered it at, uh, Broadmoor, uh, United Methodist church, I guess about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, something like that. And uh, Sarah and I had crossed paths uh, with the Yellow House, I think, but also like a connection with Baton Rouge and, and some other some of the Yellow Houses. We don't have time to get into Yellow House, but it's, so it's almost like urban monasticism. And, and Sarah's always been like the coolest person I've ever personally known, like <laughs> like a hipster and just theologically deep. And and her art is amazing. So when I was doing this series about the I am statements, because I am statements are artful in their own way, like they're all met. I am bread. I am light, you know. I am the way, right? All these metaphors. So it made sense to partner with an artist. Uh, and we were at um, Starbucks or maybe Rhino Coffee. Something. Was it Starbucks, I think? Starbucks. This may have been pre-Rhino, I mean. Long it might have been pre-Rhino. That's a long time ago. <laughs> Back in 19... You know, so <laughs> long time ago, uh, uh, we met, you know. Uh, I was like, hey, you know, Sarah, I'm doing the sermon series. Like, what does what does I am light, like, look like to you? Uh, and I remember, like, Sarah, like, like, took her camera with all these different filters and uh, it was, it was fantastic. She's like, it looks like this. I'm like, Oh my God, that's right. So then I, but then I asked, so what does I am light sound like to you? Mm. So of course, Sarah being the artist that she is like went to her studio and then this really cool ethereal electric uh, instrumental music to accompany that. And when you put those two things together, now we have this really beautiful expression without a word spoken this really beautiful expression of what I am light looks like. And then we just kept the train running, right? What does bread look like and sound like? What is I am, I am the good shepherd or I am name at the time we called it, we called it name. And it was, it was liturgical dance that, that Sarah filmed. It was so good. It's so, uh, but it was, yeah, it was like 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and, and just over time, just kept tinkering with it and playing with it to where it is now Jesus revealed. So it's, it's actually a project like 10 years in the making. Well, I love that. I mean, you're still excited about that first experience, but Sarah, from your perspective, what was that like? I mean, here you have this preacher approaching you to do this thing. Yeah. I mean, it was it was sort of a dream project for mm. a, an early mm. 20 artist right out of college. And Matt is a great pastor to work with because he's also an artist himself. Mm -hmm. So there's an understanding of how the creative process works. And there's a lot of freedom of exploration and, and trust in, in our process. And that was established early. So um, we worked then very similar to how we have worked since then. So this this conversation on the, the porch of Starbucks and like talking about these really interesting, <laughs> stimulating <laughs> ideas. And, I, mean, I remember it being very long and and um, long, long and winding. It's like forever. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 so exciting. And then we go our separate ways and and mm -hmm. make um, based on this the shared knowledge or shared ideas. Mm -hmm. But um, kind of I, I think of it as parallel play. Um, which is really st still kind of how we work. And that works very well for me. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it was, you know, that and the text that we're working from has been the same, obviously, these same uh, statements in John's gospel. But for me, looking back at that first experience, the context in which I have made the art 
is almost completely different. Mm. Yeah. Because like Matt said, I was I was living in this community house with eight other people. Um, and that was very present in the art. There were images of the people, video of our life together, sounds in the soundtrack mm -hmm. of conversations and just kind of the ambient sound of, of community. And, you know, contrasting to, to this version of the project, which was made entirely during COVID isolation. So like oh, just wow. me, the materials in a garage um, and talking with Matt over Zoom. So um, really different context. Uh, which which is interesting to contrast uh, looking back, but it was it was fun and stimulating and really formative for me. I think like in my art and my faith um, back then, ten ten years ago. I totally want to just rest there because you just contrasted like being in community and being in like relationship with human beings, and then the isolation of COVID mm -hmm. and actually displaying that in your art. I, I think those who are going to read and experience this. I just really hope that they pick up on that, like that major subtlety, if you will, because so many people right now are experiencing so much isolation, even after, if we can say after COVID, because we're still like in the midst of it, but particularly after isolation, um, sure. mm -hmm. there's still this feeling of isolation. So your art's going to speak to that in a powerful way. So let's take a look uh, kind of behind the scenes as you're talking about this new version of an image that Sarah has created for I Am The Light. Those are incredible. Like so I'm just cool. like so <laughs> wrapped up in watching you do this work. And then I'm thinking about like the musical background. Did you all have a, a option of choosing that music or was that different this time than? I made that. I was yeah. wondering, I, I just, I was like, I bet that's, that's Sarah's. Um, yeah, so I'm like sucked up in the sound and I'm sucked up in watching what you're doing. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's so incredibly amazing. So when you're create when you were creating this, um, you know you've done this over a series of years. This time, how has your perspective on Jesus and the symbols that Jesus uses how has that changed over the years? Yeah, and I, I I may need to get into that answer by talking a little bit about the actual like process of the, the art and the, the style of it, um, and and connect those dots. So. You know, I explained the different contexts through which this, you know, um, arose. But that said, my instincts in response to the statements were actually remarkably similar to what mm -hmm. they did 10 years ago, which sort of surprised me, but but that was the case. Um, but it took this new form of visual expression. Part of the reason I, like, did it more physically, you know, you saw that physical act of painting, these physical large-scale paintings, um, as opposed to the first time, which was more digital. There was mm. physicality of community in it, but the product was more digital. And I think the way I got at that physicality of connection was through actually physically doing these uh, these paintings um, in this form. But um, 
I, I consider it kind of a modern, like geometric abstraction, uh, but a form of, of maybe modern iconography. Yeah. Uh, right. For religious communities, for faith communities. And in the way that, that you know, in church history, iconography was um, used to tell the stories and the narrative of scripture and of the church prior to um, those scriptures and that written word being widely accessible pri prior to the printing press. You know, we told the stories through art, through architecture, through stained glass windows, all of that. And as the, the written word and the scriptures have become more widely available as we have our, our liter literacy rates have skyrocketed since the the Protestant Reformation. All of that um, storytelling through art and architecture has kind of faded and is less uh, prominent. But I started sensing, and I was thinking about this when we first did the project, but how um, the, the words have become so ubiquitous that it's like we either have mm. 10 Bibles in the house and never read them. Yeah. Or, this literalism that has arisen in the last one or 200 years has so limited and restricted the way that we read that we're missing out on so much. Mm -hmm. And so what can art do? What can a new modern form of iconography do to open us up to what more there is in the stories and the narratives of our faith? And so that's sort of the foundation I was working from. And, um, you can, you can see pieces of that in the original art, the triangles, the circles, the lines and things, but it's much more pronounced here. And this style for me was heavily influenced by an artist named Hilma Afklint, uh, who Matt gets jazzed about when, when I yeah. uh, talk about. <laughs> um, I, do, I love the story. You know, I love the story. It's so fantastic. So let me so, not interrupt. Go ahead. No, per, that's but, perfect. I, but I always remember her name is like Hildegard von Bingen, but that's not correct. Well, mm -hmm. she's fabulous as well. I mean, she was a, a mystic in church history. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, but Very this artist book. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. This artist is a Swedish artist and, and mystic who, um, uh, or centuries later than, than Hildegard. Hildegard yeah. um, I think she passed away in like 1944. But mm -hmm. her work um, was exploring these complex spiritual ideas that she had. And now we know after her death that it was among the first abstract art in, in Western art history, uh, but she did it largely in secret. And so we haven't known that until recently. So while people like Kandinsky, men like Kandinsky and Mondrian were credited with creating abstract art, we now know that this woman was actually very likely the first person to create abstract art. And she was doing it uh, from this spiritual place and she created altarpieces. And that inspired uh, kind of my exploration and the way that I made these. And this is why this is so perfect because yeah. I mean, the, there are layers to your artwork. It's not just like, this is what I am light looks like to me. No, it's the ge geometric shapes. It's the whole story of an, of an artist that was uh, uh, overlooked and nearly forgotten. So there are these layers of depth uh, to this, which is why it's, per it's perfect. It's perfect for the gospel of John because John has all of these layers in it. Like it's all yes. connected. It's all tied together. Yeah, things can stand on their own, but they're also when you really dive into it, like knowing the history of, of your artwork gives it a whole new, very different perspective, right? From 10 years ago to now, and also adopting this geometric um, minimalism adds a whole other depth to the whole the whole thing, right? It's fascinating. I love it because I feel like there's a connection here for me. I'm basically methacostal. I have this real like interesting. She but... prays all the time. Like it's, <laughs> I, just, I cast and I pray. It's just true. Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I think is really interesting about it is I'm so drawn into the mystics because yes. of that, like Pentecostalism, like this ethereal, like mystery, the mystery part of my faith is just so important. And so as you're talking, there's just like this permission for me to explore outside the edges um, of what's like normal and normative um, in a way that uh, when I say I'm methacostal, people are like, well, wait a second. That's not what that is. Actually, it is. And it just um, it, and it like aligns me with like thousands of years of particularly women who have this unique expression of faith in Jesus and faith in God. So anyhow. 
Um, go ahead. Yes. So that that actually perfectly bridges to me actually answering the question that you asked. <laughs> <laughs> the the, sh the shift that. in perspective on on Jesus and um, my, my and this is just sort of an aside, but my my mantra while creating this work was a, a Lewis Hyde quote that just says every mystery needs its image. Oh yes, mm, wow. yes. I didn't know that. that that was my like it. centering um, because there was some tension for me in doing this, you know, and part of the the shift in context is like I was in the thick of church work the first time we did this. And now I'm kind of on the outside yeah, you looking were. in. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> Sarah and I were both on staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah you were. You were in the thick of it. Whatever. But uh, what you said, Rachel, is so perfect because um, I was I was already playing with this style and this influence of Hilma of Clint before we started the Jesus Revealed project, but this parallel developed for me yeah. um, because, you know, I'm a person for whom context is important. So mm -hmm. I didn't just look at the statements. I, I looked at John's gospel as a whole and I looked at when it was written and who we think it was written by and, and all of that. And, you know, almost all of the commentary on John's gospel, if you haven't noticed, is written by white cisgendered hetero men including this one. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but True. The, <laughs> the women in John's gospel are the yeah. central characters, are to me yeah. the most interesting characters. And the divine feminine is so present in the pages. Yeah. The, the awareness of that interconnection, the receptivity of vision and love and, and joy and the sharing of that and the highly like relational, symbolic language that's used so much so to to where uh you know some people have asked like is it possible that a woman a woman or women were involved in writing it um and and spong uh john shelby spong talks in his book on on john that about the last version of it being written or edited by this community of jewish mystics mm. that were exiled from the mainstream life of their community mm. And so regardless of what the actual answers to those questions are, you know, playing with those theories, uh, making in light of those questions for me, reminded me um, that there's still, play there's still a place for me um, mm. in the Jesus story and the Christ narrative and that there always has been a place for the women and the marginalized voices or the, the exiled voices or people who feel other or on the outside. There has always been a place, a central place, even with Jesus, whether that is true in the church at a given time uh, or not. And that was a helpful shift in perspective, a reminder that I needed, a reminder that I am mm. grateful for. Yeah. Like you got to, I mean, you're playing on the edges, you're playing on the edges. And I think sometimes uh, when people play on the edges, there's like a opportunity for fear. But there's also, for some people, like they're like, oh, I can't get near the edge. But for a lot of folks, there is permission to play. There's permission yeah. to like, there's freedom on the edge, Sarah. And that's what you're talking about. Like you experience this faith freedom that said um, in the midst of what you're going through that there's still room at the table for me. Oh, that's so good. Oh, that's so good. Oh my goodness. So um, let me let me switch gears and let's talk to Matt. <laughs> well, could you bring it back to me, please? please? Like all this talk about like edges and women in oh, ministry. Oh my and gosh. I could oh, like, talk to Sarah here. for hours. Um, but Matt, you wrote a little book. So yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, in this incredible book that you wrote. And Matt, I just want to say like, it is amazing to see you invite other voices Oh, yeah. terribly collaborative human being. Mm -hmm. And I think the future is collaborative. And so you're inviting other voices into this experience. And so in this book, um, you are making the point that Jesus is conveying, uh, that Jesus is conveying, um, and through the gospel writer, John, um, his identity. Uh, and, yeah. you know, Sarah, you're exploring this symbolism through the art, and there's this incredible partnership. Now, for both of you, how have these symbols really changed or altered your understanding of God? Oh my gosh. Um, well, specifically for me, one is, is um, when you talk about collaboration, well, first of all, let me just say this, you know, dear audience, you see how brilliant Sarah is like yeah. collaboration on this project was, it was, it was a no brainer. Uh, but with, with the I am statements themselves, the, the, in terms of explaining Jesus's identity, these are not siloed statements, right? I am, I am light. Uh, yeah, it exists in its own, but I am light 
really starts to make more sense when you put it together with I am bread. Like, so for example, and I love how the gospel of John is really put together like this because I am bread. Well, I am light uh, is, is kind of Jesus is up there, out there. There's this divinity about it. I am light. You know, it's at the beginning of the gospel in him was life and the life was light and light shined in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Uh, and you think it's like the perfect metaphor, like why write anything else, right? Jesus is light. Uh, nothing travels faster than the speed of light. It's the boundary of everything. And light never decays because there's no mass, right? It's timeless, you know, all these things. Why write anything else? But then Jesus follows that up with I am bread, mm. which is like totally different. And so whereas I am light emphasizes Jesus's divinity, I am bread emphasizes Jesus's humanity, which I think sometimes I'm going to use the royal we, which is my own pet peeve. We often <laughs> discount uh, the humanity of Jesus. Like we're good with, yeah. with accepting the full divinity of Jesus, but we sometimes forget that he was like 12 years old. And he was, he was also fully human because bread, bread doesn't grow on trees. Yeah. Like you don't, you don't harvest bread. Bread is a human invention, right? It is, it is, it is the ability to take food with us, like where we go, this kind of thing. And, um, uh, and then you have, uh, I am the good shepherd, which brings the divinity and humanity together. Right, so you have the, the light and the bread, or shepherd represents uh, God on the one hand. Uh, I, uh, I'm the, this like the twenty third Psalm, right? The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. But it also represents an earthly leader, like like a King David, like he was literally a shepherd, right? This kind of thing. So I am, I am the good shepherd. Actually, brings together the humanity and the divinity uh, of Jesus in this beautiful, and it's also in the context of care. I'm the good shepherd because I'm I'm serving you, <laughs> right? That that's what makes me good, you know. And I love the. I love the qualifier for good, how Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And that's a lesson to all of us too, is that not all shepherds are good, you know, as a reminder of us in the church, right? Mm. Just because you're a leader in the church doesn't mean like Jesus, it's fascinating. Jesus had to qualify that with the word good, mm. right? Even then, right? Um, I am the good shepherd. I'm not like the other shepherds that you have experienced. Like that, that that's a that's a sermon to those of us who are, are in the church, right? Jesus had to qualify it that I'm good. Uh, but then it doesn't stop there, right? It goes to I'm the I'm the vine and you are the branches, where it's the first I am statement that's that incorporates us into that. So there, there's this idea of of Christ bringing us to the table. I'm the vine and you are the branches. And then we get to and this is this is what I'm getting at. A uh, very long answer for a, a short question <laughs> is what really changed for me is when we get to I am the way, mm. because like we're fine with all of these I am statements being being metaphor. Like I am light. We know that Jesus isn't glowing. <laughs> I am bread. We know that Jesus isn't like made of pumpkin or like pumpernickel or something like that. They're all metaphors. But then when we get to I am the way, oh my gosh, sometimes it's held on to with like an ironclad literalism as if, yeah. as if Jesus is offering a doctrinal statement, right? Uh, but that's not, it, that, that too is a picture and an image of something else, right? Like all good art, it, it points beyond itself. The way is, is like a roadway, right? Uh, the the way there's there's the suffering motif that is in what Jesus is telling telling the disciples that suffering can be redeemed. There is a redemption. It's not that we have to suffer in order to know who God is. It's that suffering is redeemed and redeemable. Right? Suffering is not our only identity. Suffering is not the end of the story. Is all wrapped up in I'm the way. And then of course I'm the resurrection, which ties it ties it all together. So I think that the thing that has changed for me is that these are not separate lectionary items <laughs> that, that make a really great <laughs> six week, seven week series is that when we really dive into it, there is a thread, right? Uh, our lives, a tapestry <laughs> of grace is yeah. woven together in this beautiful mosaic of a, of a, of a portrait, right? So that's really what's changed for me in these I am statements is their interconnectedness and how, yeah, they represent something in and of themselves, but putting them together, you just get, flavors that you just you just wouldn't get if you see them siloed so the, the gospel of john itself is a collaborative piece in that sense it's fascinating to me that whole piece so as you're taking a look at all of the pictures and all of the symbols and you say the way the truth and the life i think you're mm -hmm. going to set some people free just by like mm -hmm. giving them like turning that scripture and giving them a unique perspective because you're right some people hold on to that like if i don't believe this i'm done mm -hmm. and so oh that's really really good sarah yeah, well, he he did such a good job explaining all of those interconnections that I'll maybe I'll answer just kind of more broadly because, you know, I I I got excited about the book and and because Matt 
and I created in parallel. You know, right. I hadn't read this version of the book before I made the paintings. We Surprise. were, we were yeah. <laughs> do, doing those in parallel. Yeah, yeah. So when I did finally get the book um, and and read it, I I got excited that it might do something more than just open up these six or seven statements in the Gospel of John, that it might be a way to practice reading, engaging more of scripture for mm. people, because I think more of it is um, literature in a, mm. in a way that's, that's crafted and that there's more there for us. Like I spoke to earlier with the, the, the limits of literalism and all of that. Um, so for me, it's like, the, yes, the, these statements um, are obviously metaphor and Matt mm. illustrates that. But I kind of like uh, Richard Rohr's position that all religious language is metaphor in that it is language that is pointing to or trying to describe a reality that cannot be contained mm. by words. And so everything is our attempt and we can make and we need to make better attempts, but it's never the, the full reality. I actually think probably all language is metaphor in yeah. that way. Right, a sure. tree yeah. is what it is, whether I call it a tree or not. Right. Um, but so, so, but less conceptually, like all, um, all of faith for me really is built on symbol, um, these symbols and others. Um, and I will, I will risk being much cheesier and shallow than my Enneagram four self likes to be. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait for what's about to happen, but go ahead. Behind this, this painting on my bookshelf, there there's a bulletin board. And on that bulletin board, there is a fortune from a fortune cookie from right. a Thai restaurant in this, this here city. You're right. That Report. is totally cliche, but go on. And it says, um, <laughs> faith is knowing there's an ocean when you can only see the stream. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as a mm. as a person who's like a total water junkie, that just really spoke to me. But but it's it's this the stream is the symbol. Mm. And the ocean is God, the divine reality, however we we want to name it. And faith is seeing and trusting that there's a connection between the two. So the the whole thing is symbol and metaphor for me. Right. And I've used this painting a lot. There's a painting by Magritte. Um, and it's a, a, it's a, it's a, there's a pipe and it says, uh, the captions in French, which means this is not a pipe. Like, so what is it? Well, it's a picture. It's a picture of a pipe. Right. And that's kind of the point. Like when we talk about like, especially like the Trinity, when we talk about these big religious ideas that they're all pictures of a truth that rests beyond it. Right. Uh, cause I, like, like, for example, I always think I, I have this in my head and maybe, maybe some others do too, is that when I get up to heaven, I'm going to hear English and like Dave Matthews band and like Buffalo wings, like all of these very like American things from my story. And, and wh why do I assume that to be true? Right. There's this whole other reality in the heart of God, uh, that, that, that these words, these images and, and scripture is, was never meant to be read. And I think like, for example, like seminary does a disservice to us because we like sit in the library and we were like, read the Bible and read these commentaries, like alone in a silo, you know, these things, when these stories were meant to be heard in community, mm. read from the people, right? Scripture itself is meant to be an experience. And we've really tailored that into a visual critical, um, learning instead of a, a communal experience of the presence of God, period, right? So, and that's, that's what I love about incorporating artwork is that it, it pushes us beyond those boundaries and those assumptions uh, that we have, even with the stories that we've, we've you know, we, I use the royal we again, that, that people use. Yeah, you or, did. Or, or, I, I, it's my pet peeve. <laughs> that's why it's a pet peeve, because it's like looking in a mirror, like, stop saying we, man, uh, that uh, many, there you go. Many uh, <laughs> stories that many have read over and over again. So I, I, I love that aspect of how art brings us to uh, another another reality, points us to something beyond itself. So I can imagine that there are pastors and church leaders who are out there that are listening to our conversation and they're getting like caught up in the art and the symbolism and everything we're saying about the Gospel of John. And then they're saying, great, I want to do this in my congregation. Yeah. So when you're talking about using symbols and being creative, what are some things like always and nevers? These are some of the things that you should do. And these are some of the things that you should avoid. 
Um, in terms of like some like just straight up logistics uh, for clergy, you want, uh, I like the rhythm uh, of this book uh, liturgically. Like if you wanted to do like a church wide study, um, it, at least here in like in, at Asbury at my home at my church that I'm serving right now, we're uh, the first week we're going to do it's going to on the first week of October, so that by the time we get to I am the Resurrection, that will be All Saints Sunday. So like the whole series then becomes a remembrance and a celebration of resurrection. Uh, which I think is is pretty neat. That wasn't the intention of the book. It's just it's just how you know uh, it could also be used for Lent in that same kind mm -hmm. of rhythm. That there's six weeks and, and it culminates in in resurrection. And I think the thing to really do with this is kind of what you said, Rachel. Is that I hope that this gives you permission to play. Yeah. Like what would it look like if you asked the children in your congregation, "What does I am light look like to them?" Yeah. And just let there's no wrong answer to that question, right? Uh, and, and get to give because there. I'm, I'm assuming that there are creatives in your own congregation who have never been brave enough to admit that they paint or sing or dance or any of these things. And this kind of series can really open that up for a congregation to play with the way that God is, is working through them. Like when was the last time you had liturgical dance in your congregation? When was the last time that you had someone create a piece of artwork during a message or something like that? Or, or an original, because we we flip through the hymnal a lot. What would it look like for you to ask Johnny, who you know plays the guitar? Hey, Johnny, will you write an original piece of music for the week that we do? I am the vine, and you are the branches. And just it could, I mean, whatever it is, right? Just give, offer that moment, offer permission, mm -hmm. that permission to be creative, where there are no wrong answers. Because we do, we like to, we many <laughs> like to fill <laughs> <our> lives <laughs> with. With right and wrong answers, right? That's yeah. right. That's wrong. You know, the beautiful thing about art is if, if, you, if you have to like, what is the point of the Mona Lisa, right? If you have to answer that question, it's no longer art, right? There's no wrong answer to, to that question, right? Um, uh, anyway, so I, I think the, the do is, is to allow your congregation to experiment and, 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 and to play, right? Uh, to, don't, I think, would to be to read it by yourself, I'd love if you bought a copy and read it by yourself, but like that kind of like, <laughs> that's not the point is yeah. to be siloed. And th this is to be communal and experiential. And, and that's what I think that amplify portion of this Sarah's videos in particular really bring that out. Like there's this whole other component to this study that other studies just don't have this whole artful experience that is meant to be experienced in community. You know, Sarah, I'm going to ask you a question and I don't even mean to put you on the spot. So let's say you were going to show up, not necessarily to Matt's church, but like my church, and I'm doing this Jesus revealed piece. What do you want to experience? What do you want to hear? Mm -hmm. Like, um, what would be um, captivating to you to experience in a church in 2022? Hmm. That's not a big question or anything. No, no not at uh, all. Obviously, coffee, pigs in a blanket, um, <laughs> someone handing you a bulletin when you walk in. Well, coffee yeah. for sure. The use. No, yeah, coffee. Good, that's, yeah. good coffee would be a great starting point. <laughs> um, <clears throat> man, it's a it's actually a hard question, Rachel. Yeah. Like a totally fair one. Um, yeah. But hard because I I am at a place where. Um, the, the words and the language that have um, shaped and, and framed my whole life and worldview, you know, make less and less sense, at least in the way that they are used in most churches right now. And so I have a lot of conflict when I step into worship spaces right now. Um, I can't like hear church music and not cry <laughs> um, to, to, be, yeah. to be totally to be totally honest. And um, there's a lot. There's a lot that goes into that, and and a, a lot of it is largely like words really getting in, in the way um, for me right now. Mm -hmm. I would hope uh, to try to answer your question. I would I would hope that there would be um, you know evidence of this this freedom that you know Matt and I have in our collaboration, and that's mm -hmm. I think evident in the project. Like evidence of this this freedom of expression and um and collaboration amongst the people who are who are leading or who it, or who are in this environment that it, it wouldn't just be a, you know a recitation of what's in the book and and showing of the video but some creative expression in response um because i think you know whether we're talking about translating this series or just 
pastors and and worship leaders and and creatives that are collaborating um and using symbol in worship like i think the biggest thing to avoid is like literal on the nose use of the arts mm -hmm. because so much of church art and communication right now verges on propaganda right. like just Marketing. restating mm -hmm. a message and uh telling people what and how to think mm -hmm. when really i hope we wouldn't be telling people how to think but inviting them creating an experience and inviting them in to that experience that might open them up to new ways of thinking and feeling and being in the world for themselves and sarah asked me one question like when i said hey this might be a study like do you want to jump in like this could be really cool sarah asked me one question she said do i have to use words mm. absolutely not yeah. No, you don't. I mean, the irony is now we're doing a, a, a webinar where, where you're, you're offering lots of words, but I yeah. love that, right? So do I have to use words? If that is the barrier and if that is the stumbling block, then don't use a single one. Yeah. Right? I, and when I love Sarah, like, I think in this webinar, we've, I mean, you've discovered through this process of creating art that like, like there's room, there's room for folk like yourself who are saying like, I'm not sure the words that I had in the past are really going to cult. cult catapult me into the future. Yeah. I mean, um, Richard Rohr tells us that, about that all the time. What, yeah. what, what worked before is not going to work as we continue to grow. And yeah. to have the freedom to let go of all of that, including the words, and then embrace what's in the future. I mean, again, you're giving people permission uh, right. right now to say, look, even if you have, call it angst, call it like, you're, you're talking grief, grief for what you've experienced um in church that doesn't mean you're cut out that doesn't yeah. mean like and your whole life experience was for nothing um that all of it belongs in a yeah. beautiful and mystic way um so yeah that is that is really that's good that's huh? really yeah i need to have <laughs> really. sermon prep to do today I'm gonna say that again. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful and mystic way uh, yeah 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 well matt we're coming back to you we're coming back to you that's no, good I'm, that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's all right good. and so we're coming back to you let's talk a little bit about the structure of this book because oh, yeah. you you're really intentional about the structure like first you kind of talk about uh, the immediate context you've talked about the gospel of john um, and then you talk about kind of our role in it can you explain why the structure and then what you expect people to do in their role. Yeah, no. So, so yeah, in, in, in short, again, like the gospel of John is, I think best read as a drama, like as a, as a piece of artwork where uh, there is a scene. So there's immediate context of like how I am light and I am bread are being used. And then there's the act, which is in the new Testament, how, how that phrase is being used light, the imagery of shepherd and all these things. And then there's the play, which is the overarching story of God uh, through the millennia. Uh, uh, but then there's, yeah, there, there's always, there's some role of the audience, right? So again, like imagine that you're, you're at a show and you're watching a play and like you're, you're part of the audience. Yeah. There's this whole artful expression that you're, so you're having an experience, right? But the, the point is never to just leave it be. The point is for you to be changed in some way by the experience that you've had. And then you leave that place in a different place and, and hopefully, uh, inspire to create your own artwork to create your own change to create your own or to discover your own voice so uh there's there's the scene the act the play and then there's your role in, mm -hmm. in all of this right uh like like for example with with i am bread jesus fed five thousand people uh in the context of him saying that that i am the bread of life uh, and the importance of that and that i hope catapults us into considering who doesn't have bread in our communities why don't they have bread in our communities, right? Um, and, and Jesus even said, like, you came to me once to be fed. Like, I, I want to give you more, right? It's that mercy and justice component of, yes, feed those who are hungry, but then you have to ask why they're hungry uh, to begin with, right? Uh, I'm the vine and you are the branches. What I love about that is who are the branches that are missing in your community, right? Who has been uh, uh, pruned away? Uh, who mm. isn't there? Like, who is missing around the table? And to always always, always, always make room for someone who isn't you <laughs> around the table, right? So in each one of the I am statements, there is, I hope, a, a catapult into being uh, what that I am statement represents, right? Because we are incorporated into that story. It's not enough to just say, Jesus is the light of the world. 
well, how am I shining that? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, or, or, or as I like to say, like sometimes we like, you know, lift high the cross. Lift it up so high that I don't have to get on it, right? So we have to like, carry, <laughs> you know. Yeah. The, you know, in other words, it, it's like with I am light. So so with light, um, light is ultimately passive because light is supposed to illuminate everything but itself, right? When we stare directly at the light, we become blind to our own religiosity, to our own ideology. Know that turn the flashlight around and don't lift high the cross so high that you won't get on it. No, carry it. Uh, and and recognize where uh, where the the suffering is happening in the world, right? Uh, and I try to stay away from like bring light into the dark places of the world because that can also go awry. <laughs> that imagery of like light is good and dark is bad, but it's to be in the places of suffering in the world and to illuminate good. Again, if our news is not good news to the poor, then we're not sharing the gospel. <laughs> if our news does not bring release to the captives, it's not the gospel. Right. If we are not announcing the year of the Lord's favor, not my favor, not y'all's favor, the mm -hmm. year of the Lord's favor, right? And in, in the way that God works in our life, it's not the good news. So hopefully at the end of each chapter, what is our role in this beautiful, beautiful expression of, of God? How can we then be the hands and feet in the community, uh, carrying that art in a tangible way uh, out in the world? So I imagine that there are some pastors, church leaders who are listening in and they're listening us to ha have this creative conversation and they're like, Matt's an artist and Sarah's an artist, but I'm not an artist. But how are we giving every single Jesus follower permission to be an artist or to embrace art as part of their faith? Oh, I, I think that's a terrible assumption that they aren't an artist. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm just saying right? people declare over themselves. Yeah, Rachel, that's a bad that's question sure. is what I'm trying to say. Like, this is terrible. <laughs> no, 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 but what I mean by that, and, and, and I'm going to give Sarah a chance to, to speak to this, but uh, uh, um, you're not an artist. A paintbrush might not be your tool, right? right Numbers right. might be your tool. Teaching kindergarten might be your paintbrush, so to speak, right? Everyone has this, I think, uh, and that's what I learned from Disney's Ratatouille. Like, everyone can cook, right? Everyone can create. Uh, in their own way, Sarah. Like in in, in your in your realm, in, in in the work that you do, um, how would you convince someone who thinks that maybe they're not an artist and they and they don't have anything to to contribute? How how would you respond to that? Great, uh, great Ratatouille reference. I've taught a whole uh, a whole semester class on like creative image bearing by framing it on Ratatouille. So where did you teach? Really? Centenary. Yeah. I'm learning. That's cool. <laughs> like, are there still spots available? Like that it, was, it, was like a long it was a long time ago. I'll look for oh, my notes, God. but, um, All right. but, but yes, every, every human is, is making things, creating things all day long, every day. It's just that we have, we have so narrowed our idea of, of what it means to be creative or what art is. Mm. So people are making breakfast. People are making clothing choices. People mm. are making children. People are making other meals. If you don't follow Matt on Instagram, do just for the food content because it's just like art on plates. Um, <laughs> oh, God, thank you. Checks in the mail. Oh, thank you for that. That's I get hungry cool. every time That's he posts. Right. It's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's healthy too. Lots it of it is, stuff. right? Yeah, cool. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Um and and making like Matt referenced numbers, like it, it, everything we're doing, um largely we're 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 creating more than we realize uh we are. And so I think mm. it's a it's not about how can we become more creative, but how can we shift our self perspective or how we see what we're already mm. doing to acknowledge that it's creative. And when we're more intentional about that, I, I think it's very important to, to have that perspective shift because if we don't realize like we're creating and what we're creating, we mm. might be making some pretty destructive things. I mean, humans mm. have made the best of the best in the history of the world. And we have made wars and bombs and the most, uh, the most destructive. And so I, you know, I would hope that this shift and using art and creativity, um, in churches or, or just as followers of, of Christ, that, that shifts us from that role of, of, uh, audience or spectator to actively participating, um, like Matt was talking about. And, and I think 
John, again, sets us up great for this understanding because the prologue of John's gospel, the, the very first thing we read harkens back to Genesis 1, when the very first thing written about God is in the beginning, God created. So when we create, we are embodying that imago Dei, that, that image of God, uh, or we're entering the, the creative flow of life, the divine reality. I mean, creativity is, is the way of things, and we um, can participate in that. And so, yeah, you don't have to paint, don't have to sing, don't have to do all those things. You can do all those things, even if you don't think you're good at them or not. Um, but regardless of whether you see yourself as an artist in that way, um, there is art in just making a life. And mm. if you're alive and listening to this, you're already doing that. See, you say things like, I'll do this if I don't have to say any words. And then you like <laughs> drop that bomb. I was like, this us. is where you should be taking notes for your sermon. I'm going to know. That, what, oh what, my goodness. Would, would you say like creativity is making a life? Yeah. So, that's so smokes. good. That's, that's good. so good. That's so I'm gonna good. I'm steal that. I mean, I mean, yeah. Bar Coming up. at you, 2023. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, right. that's so good. Yeah. Okay, friends, I hate to say this, but we are out of time. Mm. And um, I could, I don't know, I could spend a couple more hours just talking about all I've of these things. I've learned a lot today. And, yeah, I know, <laughs> getting under the layers of all the things that we're talking about. And uh, I'm really excited about what's going to happen. I can't wait till, till people send you all uh, their own expressions of creativity mm. and art. Like I'm, I'm anticipating at least share with me uh, what you're going to experience because I think, um, again, I think you're giving people permission to be creative. You're going to set some people free in ways that the church just needs to be set free. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. No, go ahead, Sarah. You know we got. Yeah, time. if I could, I will. If <laughs> I could more words, more in. words, really, Sarah. I know. Sorry, <laughs> um, I worked very hard to find my words. Yeah, you did. Um, no, uh, so. So th that that sparks just a, a, an addendum to to your question about you know what what I would like to or hope to see in a, in a church mm. experience and and I I think I hope as people feel this permission and and hopefully are making uh, their own um, experiences art worship service in response to all this that that they might remember what Matt said about you know the difference between staring at the flashlight and turning that around and seeing mm -hmm. everything through the light of the flashlight. And that like music that is written from that place that is not just written about what the light is because that gets old and boring and problematic really fast. But if you turn around at the world, at the mundane of everyday life, at the issues of justice that Matt brought up and, and that is what we're singing about. That is what the liturgy is written about. That is what we're gathering around and responding to. That's interesting. And that's mm. relevant to people's everyday lives. That is inviting us into uh, action and, and a different kind of faith. And so that's what I would hope to, to see more of. So I'm going to say this out loud, Sarah, because I think it's true. I feel like I've been to church today. <laughs> and so... I, Again, our definitions are so narrow. And I, I mean, my soul has been enriched by your experience and your expression and your wrestling. So keep on wrestling. Um, that is so good. And thank you both. Um, this has been incredible for me. And I'm sure as people, we invite people in to experience this with us, um, it's going to be good for them as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, brothers and sisters, to experience and discover more about the study, go to AmplifyMedia.com and search for Jesus Revealed. Amplify Media has made this first episode of Matt's new study available for free. So thank you, Amplify, for sponsoring this series. Visit their website to learn more about the resources they provide churches. And friends, I just pray that you have an incredibly wonderful week. Thank you so much. <laughs>